last time we got out of the studio, we talked about how to get started rallying your car. But what if your car is a big, fat, 50-year-old bucket of rust you found by the side of the road? Well, you do what Bruce Turk did, and you turn it into a sweet vintage rally car. And you can do that, too. And that's today on Afterdrive. Listen to those pipes. <laughs> Action! Turk's place north of Manhattan. Bruce knows everything there is to know about the two-stroke Saab. Probably the preeminent two-stroke Saab expert up here owns a bunch of them, and that's where we're headed. But this ain't no Saab. The guys at uh, Classic Car Club Manhattan let us borrow this uh, 2009 Porsche Cayenne GTS, and you know it's a GTS because it's got this weird device that if you are a modern Porsche fan, you may not recognize. It's, I forgot what it's called. It's got um, some numbers on it and then you, you move it around. I, I, there's a pedal on the ground also. Um, um, also, what's cool about it is it has red brake calipers. And as my grandma used to always say, red brake calipers are a gift you give other people. That means they see them, you know, they, you get it. Welcome to Afterdrive. We know a lot of people like to collect cars or buy an old car and fix it up, but uh, not a lot of people buy an old car, fix it up, and then thrash it, either uh, racing it or in a rally situation. And that's why we're here today, is we're talking to Bruce Turk, who uh, has this Saab behind me, um, Saab 96. What year is it? Then? This is a 1961 96. 1961 96. And, um, we actually went on Facebook and asked you guys what car you would want to race or rally if money were no object. And only one of you, William Montgomery, wherever you are, William Montgomery, know that you are inside our head somewhere. You said two-stroke Saab, and that's exactly what this thing is. Absolutely. So, um, Bruce, tell me about the, the first time you laid eyes on this car and like what you were thinking and how you brought it from that situation to what it is now. It was around the mid 80s. We were driving through Saugerties, New York, and we were going past the guy who worked on foreign cars. And this car was on the side of the road. It was in excellent condition. And I immediately pulled over, went inside, went to the proprietor and said, do you want to sell that car? And he said, no, nope, nope. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to restore it someday. Meanwhile, it really didn't need a restoration. But he said, I'm thinking it's got to be worth 2,500, but I don't want to sell it. So the following year, it was still parked in the exact same place. Two years later, in the exact same place. And year after year, I would pull in. I would ask the guy if he wanted to sell it. He always refused, and it was rotting into the ground. Finally, oh, on the 10th year of stopping, he said, OK, you can have it, $250. Oh, man. So by that time, it was a Fred Flintstone car. Yeah, I saw a know? picture of it. It looked like a turkey after Thanksgiving. I mean, it, it, it was, was brutal. just, it was, it was brutal. It was, there was not much left of it. No, because every time the snow plow went by, it would throw all the salty snow on top of it. So the paint was all pitted, and the underside was pretty much gone. Wow. So, um, I mean, so you had been watching this thing deteriorate, and, and what was like, how did you decide that, you, what, what did you decide you were going to do with it at that point? 
Well, when he finally said he would sell it, I just pitied the car, you know, <laughs> and it had been 10 years of asking. So I'm like, all right, 250 bucks, I'll take it, I'll part it out. So I brought it home, I towed it home, I changed the spark plugs, put in a distributor cap and rotor, did not drain the gas, just turned the key, put another battery, and it started. <laughs> so I'm listening to the motor, and it sounds pretty good. So I said, you know what, why don't I just register it? and drive it and see what happens. So that's exactly what I did. And then you had the contest. The infamous contest. Yeah. Uh, I'm the president of a vintage Saab club, so I have everyone's email address. So I emailed everybody. Actually, this was pre-internet, so it was in the newsletter. We had a- uh, On paper. On like paper, <laughs> yeah, on actual paper. I said, I'm gonna have a contest we're going to drive this car without doing any more work to it whatsoever, and you write to me and let me know when you think it will die, when it will leave me stranded. <laughs> so everyone was writing in, you know, uh, a week, a month, six months. Well, I drove it for a year, back and forth to work, like wow. 10,000 miles. It ran fine. And, I mean, original engine, just, I mean, it was really, uh, it was a, a bucket of rust at that point. A bucket of rust. I couldn't put my feet down hard because I'd punch right through the floors. <laughs> I just put like some plywood down. And, you know, if I went through a puddle, the water would splash up. I mean, the car was rattling all over and everyone used to point and laugh when I went by. <laughs> then finally, I, I said, all right, enough is enough. You know, let's maybe restore it. Yeah. Well, all right. So how did you get it from that? I mean, it must have, it's Herculean what you did to get it from that point to it, what it is now. Stupidian is what it is. <laughs> I mean, I just took the car completely apart and then I tilted it up so I can get underneath it. I didn't have a rotisserie at the time. I was very fortunate that I had some original floor panels and rocker panels. So, you know, 200 hours later, uh, <laughs> I had it all welded up, had the floor reinforced. I did all the body work myself. Uh, the only original thing on it, I think, is the hood. All four fenders are from different cars. The doors are from different cars because they were so rusted out, you couldn't even fix them. And then I did, you know, all the body work and uh, had it painted. And I had a, a bare bone stock Saab 96. Before you did that, what was your experience in working on cars before? I mean, you had Well, I had some other old Saabs, but I was never taught how to work on cars. I mean, anyone who thinks they need a, a mentor or something, you really don't. All you got to do is take it apart, write down what you did, and then reverse the order <laughs> when you put it back together again. So I was good at, you know, taking pictures, and it was all on film, no digital anything. I'd save the pictures and then I would just reverse the order. I mean, it's no <laughs> big deal. What about welding? I mean, did you have you had welding experience? Oh, it was simple to learn. I went out, went to Walmart, and I bought a welder, and it came with a VHS tape. <laughs> I popped it in. I watched the 10-minute movie. Went in the garage. I was a welder. So of course, I ground off 90% of what I put on, but that's all it took. Yeah, just doing it. I mean, just so get, getting Do in, it. getting your hands dirty. What's the big it. deal? Well, that's the thing. I mean, I think you know. I talked to a lot of people. Who, who, the, what, the number one thing they want to learn how to do is weld, if they mm -hmm. know how to work on cars. They want to learn how to weld. So yeah. that, you would say, is the, is the thing that brought this back was well, welding. Well, I had an arc welder. Mm -hmm. Not easy. Yeah. Right? Anyone who knows how to use an arc welder, wonderful. You know, I don't know how they do it. MIG welding is so much easier, and TIG welding is easier yet. Anyone can weld. It's almost like uh, squeezing a toothpaste onto a piece of metal. As long as you have two pieces of clean metal, anyone could weld it. Once you start to weld into rust, then it becomes a little more problematic. Right. So, okay, so now we're at the point where you have a pristine, as, as much as possible, pristine Saab 96 yeah. in this color. Yeah. It didn't look like a rally car yet. Not at all. It had happened? the original interior. Well, it had a reproduced original interior. So the inside was Concours. I mean, uh. the car was absolutely perfect. It was a show car. So I put it around in it, and uh, then I decided, you know, enough is enough. Maybe I should make it into a rally car. Maybe, okay, so what, what made you want to make it into a rally car? Were you into Swedish rally cars before the... Uh... Uh, yeah, I always was a big fan of Eric Carlson, big fan okay. of rallying. I had other vintage Saabs, so I just asked myself, do I need another of the same? You know, do I need mm -hmm. another slow car? Not really. So <laughs> I said, let's just do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so what was the first, thi first thing you did when you said, okay, we're going to go rallying in this thing? Pull the motor out and put in a GT motor, something with more power. Okay. Yeah, and then I just took it from there. 
Yeah. And did you did you build the motor yourself, or did you? you uh, the first you motor that I put in was from Chris Custer. He worked for Saab, 1958 and 59. He was their performance department, so okay. he prepared all of their Saabs for racing, like in the Little Le Mans at Lime Rock. Mm -hmm. He was still around, and I was in touch with him. We were kind of pen pals, and he said, Bruce, I have my old racing motor. He said, it's fine. It, it runs. You can have it. Oh, wow. So I went down to Frederick, Maryland, and uh, the car came in, packaged in his race car. He gave me the whole shot. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it helps to be in the community of the car that you're, so if you're, if there's a car that you're interested in, I'm just sort of mm -hmm. broadening it out. If there's yeah. a car you're interested in, rallying at some point get into the community of it because then that's how you find out the people that you are have to join clubs it's so easy online now you know within one second you can google anything and and you're in you know so you have to call people don't hesitate to pick up the telephone and actually talk to someone yeah. don't hesitate to get in the car and meet them face to face right yeah, people are eager to help so the cool thing about this is the details how did it what happened so you put the motor in the motor was yeah. was straight and everything was cool what about all this other detail work, which is just amazing that you did? All I did was I got as many books as I can on vintage rallying and looked for photographs of vintage Saabs. And I just picked out all of the things that they did that I liked and incorporated them into this car. So this car is not a replica of a specific Saab rally car, but everything that's on it was used on Saab rally cars. Okay. So it's like the Superman of rally cars. I took all the, <laughs> the good stuff from all, you know, all the ones and put them all together. Yeah. Um, some of the really cool stuff is not like, I, I was just looking right at it, but let's go with the, uh, with how did you end up um, doing oh, the, the exhaust like that? The Baja exhaust. Well, yeah. You know, after you rally, for a while and you rip that exhaust pipe off six, seven, eight times, it starts to get expensive. <laughs> right. So my muffler guy says, you know, this is ridiculous. Is there another way? And I said, well, back in the 70s, Saab used to run it over the roof to do the Baja in Mexico. So I decided to do it to the two stroke. So basically it follows the same route that they did on the V4s, mm -hmm. only this is on the two stroke. And uh, after I did it, uh, I bragged to everyone at the first rally that I entered with the Baja exhaust that I would never dent it again. <laughs> and about a half hour later, I rolled the car <laughs> and uh, dented it again. So you, when you rolled it, did you knock off the exhaust or was it all right? Didn't knock it off. I mean, when I rolled, I would have kept rolling, but luckily there was a tree there to stop <laughs> me. So luckily. The, the tree smashed in the roof and the trunk just missed the exhaust pipe. Uh -huh. So when sweep came through, they f helped to push the car back on its wheels. And in true Eric Carlson style, we <laughs> hopped in, turned the key, and off we went. Yeah. We raced for two more days. Sweet. Um, it sounds like the rain is hitting the roof pretty hard. Yes, it is. Why don't we take this into the car and you can show me some of the stuff in the side sure. of the car. Sure, sure. Let's cool. do it. So, Bruce, we're in the... Saab 96, and the first thing I notice is this really swank headliner. Mm -hmm. Why does a rally car need a headliner that's this swank? Well, rally car doesn't need a headliner that's this swank, but <laughs> let me tell you why it's there. Uh, after I built the car, it was just a plain road car. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I made it into a rally car. And it was really, like, beautiful. I mean, it was Concours quality. So I said, what the heck, let's bring it to a Concours. I wrote a letter to the Greenwich Concours d'Elegance, which is like a very prestigious Concours. Yeah, that's like Bugattis and, and Exactly. Atlantic. It's like Pebble Beach, Greenwich Concours. Yeah. And they accepted me. I couldn't believe it. They said, bring it on. So I brought it there, and much to my surprise, it won Best Special Interest Car. Wow. Now, was, so, it, was it totally stock at that point, or had you started to do the uh, rally stuff? Oh, right? it was a real rally car. Oh, okay. So it was, okay. What it was is I had just finished making it into a rally car, but I didn't race it at all, so there wasn't a scratch on it. And I mean, the, the engine compartment was detailed to the max. Uh -huh. So I got the award, I got home, and I'm like, okay, been there, done that, now let's run the crap out of it. Nice. So over time, I stripped off whatever like real fancy concoursy like seats and the door panels that all came out and i just never got around ripping out the headliner well it looks it looks really nice i mean these seats are fancy. i mean these are racing seats and the details inside here are really 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 cool too mm -hmm. so since it's a rally car and since it is built to compete 
in rally, you've got the two things you need. You've got the clock and you've got the rally gauges. Tell me about this clock because this has one of the coolest pedigrees um, that I know of in terms of uh, this kind of thing, clocks. One thing stuff. I noticed when I was looking through the old Saab books was that they had these strange like Russian clocks in them. So I did a little research and found out that uh, some of them were Russian MiG-29 clocks. So I went on eBay at that point, e we had the internet, and I found this uh, MiG-29 clock. It's good to 15 Gs and it has a, it runs on I think 22 volts, which of course I don't have to, to run the heater so it doesn't freeze up at high altitude. Uh -huh. So it's shockproof, keeps pretty good time, but it's manual, you actually gotta wind it up. Really? Yeah. So if you were a Russian fighter pilot in the uh, Cold War, you had to actually wind your own clock? Is that how that works? Apparently, <laughs> I, I, I still can't believe it, and it makes absolutely no sense to me, but it's a wind up clock. But it is shockproof, so if you're bombing through a rally stage, it just stays pretty, pretty solid. Definitely, I mean, I've used it for years, it hasn't skipped a beat. <laughs> So tell me about this. What do you call this? I mean, it's a rally uh, gauge or it's a it's rally... It's a Halda uh, Speed Pilot. And go. I'm sure that anyone over the age of, let's say, 50 would look at that and know immediately what it is. And basically, instead of having this digital computerized rally equipment that they have today, back in the day, they just had a Halda Speed Pilot, which told you the time, it told you the distance, and it could also be dialed in to show you average speed. So you would set it so... Like if you had to be somewhere in an hour and you had to get there uh, at 30 miles per hour average speed, you'd set it to 30, you just drive and keep the two hands lined up and you know you're going the right speed. So you would just set the orange hand would just be at where you want to set it and then you just have to match up where the... Exactly. I mean this one is for speed, mm -hmm. so right now it's set at a little under 50 miles per hour. And then you line up the minute hand with this red hand mm -hmm. and as long as you keep the minute hand and red hand together, you're driving at 50 and miles per hour. Cool. It's very simple. And uh, Eric Carlson would have used something like that. He used that. He used this very one. Well, not that very one, no. But, but he <laughs> but used, used that he, one, the he Halda. He used the Halda Speed yeah, Pilot, yeah. yeah. And so did everyone else. I right. mean, this was, you know, state of the art. Mm. So I also noticed um, Eric Carlson's autograph. It looks like, it, it actually looks like Beef Breadman. Yeah, or Eric Goodman. Or, or Eric Goodman, or that's a good one, yeah. Yeah, many years ago, Eric Carlson was in the car. And I handed him a magic marker and he said, okay, I'll sign the glove box. But he's such a big guy, he was all cramped up and he couldn't, you know, sign it properly. So he goes, oh, this is no good. It lo looks like Goodman. He says, you take off glove box. You send to me, I'll sign it and mail it back to you. But I said, you know what? It's good just it's how cool. it is. I yeah, like it's it. fantastic. I mean, that's how he did it. If he had to, you know, squeeze in to do it. And by the yeah. way, Eric Carlson, other people on the internet may know him as the, the guy sitting next to the Saab that's upside down on its roof, Absolutely. drinking a beer. Yeah. I don't know if it was a beer. Or was something. <laughs> it might have been a soft drink. I don't yeah. know what kind of uh, soft drinks he, they and were. I think yeah. he was wringing out his socks or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, shot. Eric either won or rolled, mm. you, one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> um, another thing I noticed in here is um, your dash is immaculate. How did that happen? Well, this is a, a foam dash. It's actually uh, foam underneath vinyl, and they crack all the time. So I was very fortunate that an elderly gentleman in Cornwall, New York, had an old sob under his porch, mm -hmm. and the weeds had grown up blocking it in. And uh, I offered him like 100 bucks for the car because it had a perfect dash pad on it. So I brought the car home, removed the dash pad, and towed the car to the junkyard. That how, was the end of it. Well, how many cars do you think pass through here just for parts and then and then took a hike once you got what you wanted out of them? Oh, several, <laughs> several, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm always looking for parts cars and I just take, you know, the best parts and junk the rest. I can't keep it all. Yeah. Otherwise the place would look like a junkyard. Yeah. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, so a map light, obviously the co-driver would need a light mm -hmm. for the map, that's this one, or for the pace notes. What's this thing? This looks like a, uh, a license plate light. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> Yeah, back in the early 60s, they needed more light for map reading. So they said, why don't we use the license plate light from the 93B? So this is from a 1958 Saab 93B. There were two, one on each side of the license plates. Wow. And they mounted it right here. And uh, it helped to light up whatever it was that they were reading, whether it be the map or, uh, you know, 
Whatever. That, that's very cool. And of course, you have the the ham radio, uh, which a lot of rally organizers want you to use. They do. I mean, pretty soon, I think all rally cars will have ham radios. It helps you communicate with uh, emergency vehicles and with net control. It's very, very important. So tell me about what it's like to keep a rally car running, a rally car that's not you know, a late model car, a car that's 50 something years old mm -hmm. that uh, isn't easy to get parts. Now, obviously you being uh, the president of the, uh, the Vintage, Saab, Vintage Club. Saab Club, yeah. have, you have a ton of parts just as you've accumulated exactly. over the years. Yeah. But if someone were, someone were to want to get into vintage rallying, what advice would you have for them in terms of keeping it running? First thing, if it's a sub, join the Vintage Sub Club <laughs> in North America right. and start sending emails, whether it be to me or to other club members. Uh, then go on our website and access our membership list. So really networking with other people is the most important thing that you can do. And you can't be shy. you got to get out there and, and start emailing and making phone calls. I mean, you were telling me before, this is sort of interesting, that while eBay has been really good for finding rare parts, mm -hmm. it has... it. It has its disadvantages also. It has disadvantages for someone who's looking for like the ultimate score like I used to, you know? <laughs> right, right. I mean, the object of my game was to find that proverbial barn that's packed with parts that you could get for free or 50 yeah, bucks, you right. know? Those days are over because now everyone with a barn has a computer and they have access to eBay. Yeah. So years ago, we would go to old car, old Saab dealerships and clean them out of parts. You know, that's all done. Yeah. That's been picked clean. Can't right. do it. So how do you feel about Saab now? I mean, what what um, what went through your head when you realized that Saab was actually going away completely? Because I mean, obviously, the company had been you know had its ups and downs in mm -hmm. the last twenty years. But what about when it was really clear it was going away for good? I mean, I felt bad for the employees. Yeah. I didn't feel bad about the car itself because I'm a vintage Saab guy, and it's yeah. not like they were making vintage Saab parts so I can stay, you know, riding <laughs> my vintage Saabs forever. <laughs> so as, in terms of, you know, what did the company do for me in the later years? Nothing. You know, they were making new cars. Right. But, you know, it's a shame that such a neat car, quirky car, that came out with their best cars at the very end is suddenly gone. Yeah. That's a shame. Yeah. So other than rallying, do you, are there other events that you do, other kinds of, of racing? I, I do. I do some hill climbs. Uh, I was in the Hershey Hill Climb, which was just for vintage cars, but that's since been discontinued, unfortunately. I do ice racing occasionally. Uh, I do rally cross quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, rally cross is great. You know, the, the whole track is very short. might take a minute or two minutes tops. It's a lot of fun, and anyone could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Where does this car excel in a regular rally stage? Because obviously, you know, horsepower-wise, torque-wise, you're not going to be able to compete if you were taking this into, like, a regular rally exactly situation. Exactly right. I mean, when I'm in the real twisty bits, I'm very competitive. Mm -hmm. I'm probably mid-pack compared to even four-wheel drive cars. Mm -hmm. When I'm going downhill, I'm competitive. Right, right. But where I get slaughtered is when I'm coming out of a turn and I scrub off speed, I can't pick up speed quickly it takes forever to spool it back up yeah. and if I hit an uphill section I'm done I mean I could read a book <laughs> <laughs> if you had to give someone advice who was kind of launching one of these projects mm -hmm. who wanted to build a vintage rally car whether it was an Audi or a Saab or you know uh, even um, maybe an old Lancia even mm -hmm. I don't know who would be crazy enough to do something like that <laughs> but I'm sure people are out there what are the, what's the best advice you've got from all the stuff you've done? Because you've been doing this 25 plus years, right? Yeah, the, the best thing to do is join a club and meet people, mm -hmm. you know, talk to people, and then just do it. I mean, you got to get off your butt. I mean, I know so many people say they don't have time to restore a car, or they don't have time to go out and do a little racing. It doesn't take a, a lot of time, especially the restoration. If you have an hour every few days to put aside, Get out from outside. Don't sit on the sofa. Go in the garage. Work on the car. Mm -hmm. Just make it happen. Cool. One last question. Why Saab for you? Well, it probably goes back to when I was a kid, and I used to see the Saab Sonnets on the road. Back then, they the were... The Sonnets, the sports yeah, car. Yeah, right, okay. Right. They were just cars, and uh, I always pointed at them and said, well, someday, I'm going to have one. So when I was 16, I went out and I bought one. And it's been like a love affair ever <laughs> since, you know. They kind of grow on you. How many have you had? 
Sobs in general? Uh, I think I've had 10 vintage Sobs. Wow. Right now I have nine. It's only one slip away. <laughs> <laughs> which, which one got away? Was it the? It was the very first one, the one I had when I was 16, oh, the wow. Son Ed, and I was terrorizing the neighborhood. My parents said, it's got to go. <laughs> so out it went. Right. And here we are. Um, how, so beginning to end, how long did it take you to build this thing? This was probably a four-year project. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was drivable the first day. So it kind of evolved. It was a rolling restoration. Mm -hmm. Every summer I was able to get in it and drive. And every winter I would take it back apart and just continue. So when you started rallying it, uh, how did you, was it, I mean, it was just all a big shakedown for the, just making sure that everything worked all the time? Or is it just? Well, yeah, I mean, the first rally that I did, I was doing course opening and the car was vibrating and parts were falling off the car, you know? <laughs> I mean, the, the generator, fell off and I was having a heck of a time. So I repaired whatever broke, the weakest link breaks, and then the next time the next weakest link would break. Mm -hmm. And as the years go by, you end up with like a bulletproof car. So it's just that you just have to keep doing it until you fix everything that's the weakest. It's not like there was a, a rule book <laughs> or a construction manual for this right. car. So it was basically go out, break it, fix it, go out, break it, fix it. Right, and now you're an expert. Yeah, I'm an expert at braking. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Bruce, thanks. You're thanks welcome. for coming on. Yeah. That's After Drive. I'll see you guys later. Next week. <laughs>